Welcome back to ISSR's In Conversation. As always, I'm your host, Anthony K. Nairn, Executive Assistant of the International Society for Science and Religion. And I'm pleased to be bringing you Episode 5 of our In Conversation series, which puts ISSR fellows in conversation with each other over matters related broadly to the academic field of science and religion. A quick note, if you haven't seen already, this year's Boyle Lecture on Science and Religion a prestigious annual lecture series that has its roots dating back to the 17th century, is available to watch or listen to via our ISSR YouTube channel and our podcast. This year's lecture was Professor Christopher Southgate of Exeter University, with a response by Andrew Davidson of Cambridge University. A live discussion about the lecture is also available to watch or listen to and includes the additional response by Celia Dean Drummond of Oxford University, amongst others. I will put the links of those two special episodes below. Flourishing has become an increasing area of attention in the academy as of late, as more researchers and institutions have invested time and resources into understanding the broad complexities and intricate entanglements that influence, contribute to, and impact flourishing. Now, this term usually applies narrowly to human beings, but part of the increased attention has been to look at flourishing more broadly. So not only human beings, but also, and especially of import today, as climate change threatens to drastically alter many areas and types of life on the globe, but to apply flourishing to animals, ecosystems, and the planet more generally. As any pet owner will tell you, flourishing can come from the care and well-being of one's dog, cat, bird, whatever, and the benefit gained from having the companion. Flourishing is a wide-reaching topic, that has serious implications for the future of our species, all species even, and the world's environments. And flourishing also has important implications for aspects of our societies and cultures and the structural components that we depend on, whether daily or not. In conversation today are two ISSR fellows who are keenly interested in this important topic. Thomas J. Ward is Professor of Open and Relational Theology at Northwind Theological Seminary in the U.S. state of Florida, and is the director of the Center for Open and Relational Theology at Northwind. As a theologian, philosopher, and scholar of multidisciplinary studies, he's won numerous awards for his work, of which he has published more than 25 books. He has also won numerous outstanding faculty awards and lectures around the globe on topics ranging from love, open and relational theology, science and religion, and Wellesleyan Holiness Church of the Nazarene Thought. He is also an avid hiker and quite a wonderful photographer. And in this episode, Tom will be speaking with Matthew T. Lee, Emeritus Professor of Sociology at the University of Akron, and he is currently Senior Research Scientist at Harvard University and Director of Empirical Research at the Human Flourishing Program at Harvard's Institute for Quantitative Social Science. He is also a distinguished visiting scholar of health, flourishing, and positive psychology at Stony Brook University's Center for Medical Humanities, Compassionate Care, and Bioethics. His current research explores such topics as benevolent service to others, organizational compassion capability, and the integration of social sciences and the humanities. Matthew is a leading topic member of the Global Flourishing Study a huge $43 million grant jointly hosted between Baylor and Harvard universities. And it is this grant and the shared interest in love that is the source of our episode today. Links to both of these scholars are below. Please enjoy this first episode of ISSR's two-part In Conversation series on flourishing titled Love and Global Flourishing. Welcome to this conversation, Matt. Uh, we have heard the impressive bio that you have and all the things you're doing, but uh, tell us a little bit more about what inspired you to pursue the kind of work that you're currently doing. Well, thanks, Tom. It's good to be with you. And, um, you know, that would fill up the whole hour. So I, <laughs> I will keep it brief. I'll just note that I was trained as a criminologist and my first book was on criminal homicide. And, you know, you study that for a while, like I did, you know, over 10 years. And, um, you know, it's not, 
It's not an uplifting topic, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I started um, to talk with a, a retired colleague um, at my previous university. I was at the University of Akron and um, Margaret Paloma had an office right across the hall from mine. And she wasn't going to be voting on my tenure case. So I thought, well, I can explore some ideas with her without you know, indicating that I might be switching my scholarly identity right after being <laughs> tenured, which you know, sometimes they don't like, but it actually worked out okay because um, I started teaching a class called Sociology of Love. And then that uh, I retitled to Love in Action and then eventually I retitled it to the meaning of life. So it sort of had several iterations, but the course became more experiential over time. And it was, it was very popular with students. And so when something's popular, nobody fights you on yeah. it. Um, and I started working with Margaret and Stephen Post on a grant project. And you were involved on our core research right. team. We had um, scholars from the social sciences and humanities of all kinds of different disciplines. Um, to try to explore the, um, the ways in which spiritual experiences empower benevolent service to others. And I found that more uplifting. <laughs> to put it, <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> to put it mildly. And then eventually I did um, become part of a, of a project that looked at um, adolescents who were trying to maintain their sobriety after significant struggles with drugs and alcohol and even some violent delinquency in some cases and um, and how you know kind of a spiritual awakening or engagement with spiritual virtue um, could help them maintain their recovery and uh, so that was a nice coming together of, of both um, kind of aspects of my work up to that point but what I didn't fully appreciate is that there was an emerging, perspective that goes beyond positive psychology or well-being or happiness or some of these um, concepts that we've heard so much about. Um, but this emerging perspective was looking at flourishing, which, which mm -hmm. seems to be deeper and seems to be grounded in the humanities, um, philosophy, theology, and other disciplines. So, so what are the matters of ultimate concern and how do those mm -hmm. intersect with subjective well-being and some of the things that have been, you know, studied a lot. I think there's something like 14,000 new articles published on well-being every year. It's, wow. You know, um, so we've taken that topic um, pretty far, and you know, now we can go deeper with it. And so I, I really was um, overjoyed when I learned about the program on human flourishing at Harvard, and when I had my first conversation with Tyler and, you know, talking about the different domains of well-being and how, when you put those together, that's more complete well-being or what we might, um, with all humility, call flourishing. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, not just the individual experience of life, which is one of the measures that Tyler has developed, but also community flourishing, yes. also mm -hmm. spiritual flourishing, and then we can think about ecological or planetary flourishing, and we can begin to connect all of these things. And so some of my most recent writing has been an attempt to be begin to integrate and talk about multi-systemic or intersystemic flourishing. And nice. uh, that's, that's really exciting, especially as we're about to embark on this global flourishing study. Yeah, I want to talk to you about that for much of our time, because that is exciting news. And so uh, uh, correct me if I got any of the details wrong, but it's called the Global Flourishing Study. Yes. And you've mentioned Tyler, you and Tyler and some others are part of a team. The grant is something like $43 million funded by at least half a dozen in, uh, <laughs> philanthropies, um, maybe even more. Um, that's a pretty big deal. And it just what came became news last spring spring of 2021 is that right i think it had its launch in october of oh last okay year and they're october just they're just now so gallup is doing the data collection and they're rolling that out soon so the data haven't even been the first wave has not even been collected yet so um a lot of planning went into that so so tyler was one of the pis and byron johnson at baylor's institute oh yes Religion was the other pi and then there's a large team, um, you know, a number of us are leading up 
uh, topics. And so mine is love. And so I'll be looking at love across the 22 countries and what's the relationship between love and flourishing, which is, as we've talked about over the years, a, a special interest <laughs> for both of us. So that, right. that can be part of our conversation. But, you know, but people are leading up um, different topics, a whole range of topics. And, you know, it's really exciting to begin, again, to think more holistically about not just the subjective experience of well-being, but how the different pieces fit together and then to watch that unfold over time. And that's really right. the innovation here is a lot of work has been cross-sectional, but we can't see change over time. And so you're always wondering about reverse causality. And there, there's always mm -hmm. questions about, well, what is really driving it and what's the outcome? And and so being able to watch the change unfold over five years, we'll follow up with the same um, individuals each year for five years. We'll have nationally representative samples in 22 countries. And so it reflects uh, about half of the population of the world. And um, to be able to see how their individual changes might be related to what's going on more broadly in their societies um, will shed a lot of light on uh, the factors that seem to be driving flourishing. And that's not to say that um, um, self-report survey data are the only way to get at this. And you know, we're, sure. we're the first to, to, to acknowledge that we need to study this in a lot of different ways, but it is, um, you know, it already costs $43 million just to do a survey. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's part of the thing that really grabbed my attention when I saw the announcement, started digging into the details. It was the scope of this, this yeah. project. I mean, yeah. not only the 22 countries, uh, about a quarter of a million people who are going to be surveyed or involved, participate mm -hmm. in some way. And the fact that it's longitudinal, you know, this isn't a, a study of, 25 undergraduates uh, at your university for one semester. This is a big, big deal. Um, what do you anticipate being some of the rewards for that kind of scope, especially in terms of the longitudinal dimension? Yeah, I, and I think um, another important part is it's not just Western countries which have been True. studied to death. So, yeah. you know, can we make comparisons across? very different cultures um, using the same measures? That's a big question. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe the longitudinal data, when we see this changing over time and we see how the changes change together, maybe we'll feel a little bit more comfortable about the kinds of comparisons that we can make. Um, yeah. But what I see happening, I mean, there's, a, there's at least a few things here, but one that comes to my mind immediately is that this might encourage um, future data collection efforts to go beyond income and physical health when they're asking about well-being and quality of life and begin to ask some of these more nuanced questions about meaning and purpose and quality of relationships. And, you know, we've, we've got a whole range of variables on demographics, economic issues, politics, religion, um, you know, community, and a variety of well-being measures, including Tyler's flourishing measure. So um, we're hopeful that because um, the findings we think will be quite compelling, that it will encourage um, governments and non-governmental organizations to collect these kinds of measures more routinely and just mm -hmm. um, offer more insight into how people are doing. Because, you know, GDP is, is one measure, but it masks a lot. Right. So what, you know, one of the things that we found already is that in some places where we've had worker sample, samples in non-Western countries, um, we find that there are higher scores on domains like meaning and social relationships and um, uh, character and virtue than we find with more materialistically well-off Western uh, samples. And so you know, we, we want to better understand that and what, what can we learn from other cultures and what can other cultures perhaps learn from us. And so right. the assumption that, that flourishing is going to be um, in a very simple and linear way tied to income or tied to wealth is already, you know, quite questionable, but we can begin to explore why. And then encourage, as I said, governments and non-government organizations to do these national surveys 
and not just do cross-sectional surveys, but study the change over time. It's more expensive, but in a lot of these cross-sectional, um, with a lot of these cross-sectional findings, you're not really sure what would be actionable because you don't actually know what's going on. So let's yeah. not base our policy on something that might be, you know, involved in a reverse uh, causal kind of relationship. And yeah. so, you know, we would be better off spending, having fewer surveys that are longitudinal rather than, you know, a thousand surveys that are cross-sectional. So in the long run, it's actually a more efficient use of resources, but you have to find organizations that appreciate that. And, and we're grateful <laughs> to the, the many funders who stepped up. Um, any one of them, um, you know, would have had a difficult time convincing their boards to, to put that kind of money into it, but collectively um, it was able to work. So we're, we're very grateful for that and hope that it um, inaugurates a new era of uh, paying close attention to change over time with, with nationally representative community samples. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, you, you mentioned Tyler Vanderweel and uh, the uh, flourishing measure, and that's so important. I want to highlight it mm -hmm. and let uh, folks who are listening or watching this know what those uh, six sort of areas are, and then ask you a question in relation to that. So the uh, flourishing measure asks questions that and try to measure uh, f six general areas. First of all, happiness and life satisfaction. Secondly, mental and physical health. Third, meaning and purpose. Fourth, character and virtue. Fifth, close social relationships. And sixth, financial and material stability. And I love that the, last, that the finances last there. <laughs> I don't know how many times uh, things yeah. seem to be judged by whether or not they bring happiness, as whether or not someone has more jobs or something right. like that. And I'm so glad. I mean, it's got to be part of it. And that's a very yeah. comprehensive list. I mean, you can't get everything there, but that's pretty impressive. Yeah all the dimensions. So, so, Ty my so question Tyler has, let me just say on that, okay. point, Tom, Ty Tyler has referred to the first five domains as the flourishing measure. And then when you include the financial piece, you get secure flourishing. So oh, the first okay. five nice. are um, widely understood around the world as ends in themselves. I don't um, only want um you know, close social relationships so I can make more money or find more meaning and purpose. I want it right. for its own sake. And so right. those first five are really desired, almost universally desired, probably universally desired um, for its own sake. And then the financial material stability allows people to sustain the search for those first five over the life course. If you don't have enough food to eat or adequate shelter, um, you know, you, you might have difficulty um, achieving your other goals in life. And so um, we're not asking people, how much money do you have? Um, his measure very thoughtfully asked people, do you worry about your expenses? So someone mm -hmm. who lives a very modest lifestyle may not have that much money, but they're not worried about it. And they're mm -hmm. achieving these other goals. And so it doesn't matter how, how much sort of absolute wealth you have. What matters is, uh, you know, how does your life, how do these domains fit together in your life? Yeah. And so the financial material aspect is really a means to an end. And so we call that secure flourishing when we include that domain, but the first five are, are really about um, uh, flourishing itself as, as the search for the ultimate ends of life. And, you know, people yeah. would say, well, what about um, spiritual well-being? Well, Tyler and, and colleagues have developed a measure of spiritual well-being. And so the reality is for most of the population in the world, that will be important. And we would want to measure that but not for everyone. So some people would say, I'm not, I'm not spiritual, I'm not religious. And so um, the, the basic measure is really just um, kind of a consensus. What do most people think is important? And then we can supplement that with other measures. And we also wouldn't want to neglect the community level as I was alluding to earlier. So there's a, so Tyler's developed a measure of community well-being that incorporates the individual flourishing uh, 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 survey items, but also adds a consideration of what's happening at the group level. And so, you know, we, we're not suggesting that this individual measure captures everything, but sure. it's a starting point. And with, you know, 10 very short questions, um, you can cover a lot of ground. And then if you add the financial material questions, it takes you to 12. And then we've got a short community well-being 
measure of five items. So, you know, for less than 20 items, you can start to get a pretty good mm -hmm. picture of the integration across the individual and, and the community. Um, and so I think it's really important to, to note that um, we're not saying that, you know, perhaps artistic creation or something else is not important, but something like that might also be reflected in your level of meaning and purpose. Right. And so I think when, you know, when Tyler was putting this together, he was thinking, well, a deep sense of spirituality might affect your meaning and purpose. And so he started thinking in terms of pathways. So religion and spirituality become a pathway that mm. by which a person can um, uh, obtain these desired ends. And uh, they could be studied in their own right uh, as well yeah. as, as and you could outcomes. you could take someone's employment, the, their work as also another means to somebody. Yes. So it's, it's people work often. There's some people who work who get paid very little. They're not yeah. financially entirely stable, but they find such personal satisfaction in yeah. the work they do that leads to such great flourishing. I yeah. guess I guess what I was trying to say in my question is I get tired of the ultimate measurement being GDP yeah. or more <laughs> jobs created or an increase in personal wealth. I just think, oh, I mean, yeah. I don't want to dismiss that, but that just seems like a small fraction of what it means to flourish. Well, and if we think about, <clears throat> you know, if we think about flourishing as I can flourish at the expense of everyone else and at the expense of the planet, it doesn't really seem to connect <laughs> with, you know, notions of stewardship that you find in religious traditions or right. philosophic traditions. So responsibility and other kinds of things. So that doesn't seem quite right. So, <laughs> you know, it's not about what can I extract in order to boost my scores on these domains, but what are the relationships um, yeah. across these different levels that enable all of us to flourish and just searching for more, more, more in this kind of, um, you know, GDP focused um, yeah. mindset really does wear out the world and create conflict, you know, all over the world. And so we, none of us can flourish if that's the level of our awareness. So we're trying to think about how as social scientists, can we draw upon some deeper wisdom from the humanities I mean, I'm a social scientist, yeah. and I'm I'm happy to be a social scientist. But um, you know, we're not always the deepest thinkers in the room. <laughs> <laughs> You're good so, at math, but <laughs> so, so who can who can help us? Like like what what skills do we bring? And then let's draw upon the skills of others who are really thinking through this at a deeper level, and let's begin to construct measures and then interpret results in ways that are consistent with that. So if we're not so one you know, contribution a colleague and I made to our measuring well-being book was a, a measure of inner peace. And you know, mm. I would say, if you're experiencing all of these other things, but you're you're feeling less and less peaceful inside, mm. you know, maybe something's off. And then <laughs> we can say, well, what about harmony with others? You know, my own mm. inner peace and my ability to be in harmonious relationships with others. And so this, you know, brings back issues of equity and politics and, mm -hmm. um, you know, ethics and all, all of these things. And so I think that we really start to get a, a more robust understanding of what it means to flourish in community. There's, there's a great book um, that almost everybody knows about now. It's called Braiding Sweetgrass. And it's mm -hmm. sort of this um, attempt to, to bring into dialogue indigenous wisdom with science and natural science. And it's, it's beautifully done, but it says very early on that all flourishing is mutual. And, mm -hmm. and that's something that I think you could use some of the measures off the shelf and find that some group is doing well according to subjective well-being, um, but they haven't really uh, grappled with the reality, sort of the ontological mm -hmm reality that all flourishing is mutual in the long run. And if we keep right. thinking in the short run, more, more, more GDP, GDP, you know, that's not going to get there. So no. um, I think we're starting to very slowly have some convergent thinking across disciplines and across cultures that it's time for us to really begin to pay attention to the insight that uh, human beings have known for thousands of years that all flourishing is mutual. And right. so that's that's really the only way forward um, for us as we stand on the 
brink of World War Three and you <laughs> yeah. know, climate, climate change, change and yeah. COVID and all the rest. Uh, so yep. now we now we've got we're forced to see this reality. Now what? Yep. So do we have the will? Um, to, and this is where I know we're going to get to love at some point. But for me, this is where love provides the motivation. If if we're not well, before we don't we have the there, open heart and the open mind, how, you know, how are we going to how are we going to have the will to do yeah. this hard work? <laughs> I want I want to talk about that because I think that's super important. But before we get there, I want to put on the critic or the skeptic's hat just for a second. Sure. sure. Um, I can imagine someone sort of listening to this conversation saying. The scientific study of love? You got to be kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> the science of flourishing? Aren't those value claims? And isn't science yeah. ignoring that? We're just studying the facts, ma'am, you know, kind of a thing. Yeah. How do you respond to people who are look at you incredulously and you say that you're trying to do a scientific study of flourishing and love? Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful question. It comes up all the time. And it's one worth having um, a lot of voices way in on. So I'll offer mine again in this, okay. you know, spirit of humility, but um, you're certainly a prolific author on love. And so you can chime in, you know, and, and address <laughs> any of my shortcomings, but, you know, you, you need a really um, broad, uh, diverse conversation about this topic. You know, I would say what, you know, scientific studies of love um, up to this point have been largely um, you know, what, what science, social scientists call prototypical. So we don't really agree on a definition of love. And so we sort of study something that in a fuzzy way is related to something that someone else is studying that they call love. And so it's really, <laughs> it's really hard to have a well-ordered science where we have an agreed upon case definition, and then mm. we can study it reliably. So we're getting all of these unreliable results because we don't have consensus about what love is. And I think that if you look across, so we've been working on this problem for a while and, you know, you can start um, with a foundation like uh, the writings of Thomas Aquinas and you can say, um, all right, whatever else love might be, it's probably going to involve the contribution to the growth of another person. Um, mm -hmm. If we're talking about interpersonal love. So if I say that I love my friend, Tom, then I want to contribute to your flourishing in some mm -hmm. way. Um, and that means I have to get to know you to know what is helpful. I can't just impose something on you. And so genuine contribution to the growth of another is part of it. And then the other part of it is um, this, this sense that, you know, we desire to be in relationship somehow. And it may mm. not be in person. It might be over Zoom or, you know, writing letters to each other or something. But so the contributory dimension of love and the unitive dimension of love seem to be um, very common across cultures. And in mm. fact, we've shared this with, uh, we had a symposium on love and world religions, and we invited representatives from non-Western, you know, not, or non-Christian traditions to come in and offer some remarks on love. And we shared these, uh, this contributory and unitive um, dimension of love with them. And, you know, is there anything in your tradition that would say no to that? No, we wouldn't say no, we would say yes and, and we would add something sure. to it. Yeah. And so I think that there is a kind of essence to love that we can um, explore in a way that would lead to more comparable studies. Because if you define it one way and I define it a different way and we get different findings, is it because we're studying love and we've really got something to talk about or are we just playing word games? Here? Yeah. And yeah. so a lot of disputes are verbal disputes rather than genuine disputes. And that's a chaotic science. And that's what we've had up to this point. So we're not saying um, that there's only one definition of love, right, but we right. do think that if you start to look across studies, um, there, there was a pretty good study that, that found that across different types of love, caring for the other seemed to be important to people. Like mm -hmm. they could say this, that, or the other thing. Of course, there's some studies that some small segment of the sample will say, well, you know, controlling, dominating behavior, you know, infatuation, jealousy, all of these kinds of things are all part of love. But that's not what most people say most of the time. It's usually right. something that's actually beneficial. I care about you. I want you to grow. I like being in relationship with you. Those kinds of things seem to come up to the surface a lot. So uh, I do think that it's possible for us to move beyond chaos 
which is the, the, the approach that says there are no values. So let's just let everyone define it. All 7.5 billion people can have <laughs> 7.5 billion definitions of love. And that's interesting. Like, where's the alignment? Where's the disagreement? That's not yeah. useless, but it's not the only way forward. And so I think that if we don't have a value, we are in some ways implementing the value of chaos. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no such thing as a value-free science. And especially yeah. if we're doing this in a very reductive, materialistic way that sort of misses the point. I mean, this is the knock on research on prayer. Like if you think as a scientist, um, this person has an illness and they're going to pray to get healed or get cured from that, and then it doesn't happen. Now I've proven scientifically that prayer doesn't work. That's not the only way to understand prayer. There's, there's a, a way to think about prayer that's involving one's life um, sacramentally in the life of the group and in the life of the divine. And that's not about physical cure necessarily. But you know, mm. oftentimes, if we have this very oversimplified reductionistic approach, we're not even going to pay attention to the group's theology because we're just trying to debunk it anyway. So, so that's a value. <laughs> that's expressing a, a kind of a set of values that are yeah. um, anti-foundational is sort of what they say in the humanities. And that's been popular and it's created a nice little culture of despair that, you know, uh, <laughs> depression rates are rising and anxiety is rising and we don't seem to have any solution and we can't agree on anything. So, all right, that takes us, you know, into one direction for a while, but what happens when we start to start with a foundation, it doesn't have to be Aquinas, but let's look at how what Aquinas is saying might align with what um, thoughtful people in other traditions have been saying about love for thousands of years. You know, right. love is patient, love is kind. That's very different than you can't really tell the difference between love and hate. And there, there are some <laughs> people who argue that you can't. And, and I think that's wrong. I think we have different words to sort of point to different things. And I'll just say one very quick thing about love. Any definition is going to fall short. And, right. you know, Paul Tillich, you know, theologian noted that, you know, he said, I'm not going to give a definition of love because love's the highest value. And you try to explain it in terms of lower values and it fails. But love is life in its actual unity by which life overcomes its self-destructive tendencies. So if you have division, if you have destruction, if you have self-destruction and group destruction, then you can be pretty sure that's not love. We can call that hate. And both of these words are, are going to fall short of transcendent mystery. So in, you know, in life, the best things are transcendent and can't be named. The love that can be named is not love. You know, the, the Tao mm -hmm. that can be named is not the Tao. Um, but then the second best things are, are mythical. And we try to use language and metaphor to point to these transcendent things that can't be named. And that falls short a little bit. And by the time we get to empirical, it's third best. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, so this is the saving grace for the empirical. If we have a good measure of love, we might predict a lot of important outcomes. So gotcha. um, Tyler and some of my colleagues um, have done a paper looking at parental warmth and the effect of parental warmth on uh, children as it's experienced later in life. And you know, there's all kinds of positive emotional and health benefits later I in life think. if you grew up with warm parents. That's not quite love but it's, get, it's pointing in the direction of love. And if we had a really good measure of love, we might be able to explain more variance in our outcomes. And so there is value to the empirical, I mean, you know, I'm an empirical scientist, so I, right. I, I haven't changed careers yet, but, <laughs> but I do think that any definition we come up with is going to fall short of the depth of life. And then any measure that operationalizes those definitions is going to fall short further still. So the first best we know from our own experience the second best, we try to tell a story about it. And the third best, we try to document it with a survey. <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> well, and I think as you, as you, I guess you said, maybe even hinted at, um, it, as part of that, it's not like the other scientists or the other sciences are completely objective. And this one just happens to have some objective value, values right. in it. There's, you know. Um, so that was great answer. You yeah. mentioned a little bit of theology in there. So that brings me to a question, of course, that uh, the uh, International Society for Science and Religion cares a lot about. And that is, well, where does the religion fit into this? And this is a huge question. So uh, we're not expecting you to <laughs> <laughs> give the definitive answer. But for your own thinking, um, you know, how do you think about theology, divine action, religion? How does that fit into your 
your own work? Well, I've been very fortunate to have been involved in some conversations with the Fetzer Institute recently, and they have been doing work for a long time on the transformative power of love to promote good in the world. And they're increasingly interested in what they're calling the shared sacred story across mm. all of the different religious traditions as it might relate to flourishing and not you know, not just the subjective experience of happiness or positive affect, but really, you know, deepest flourishing, you know, flourishing that is good for all people. And so, um, you know, there are important differences across different um, traditions, you know, within a single religion, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, sure. theological conflicts and debates, and, and certainly across the different religious traditions. But, you um, there are some, some common themes that seem to come up with some regularity, and one of them is love. And so uh, a member of our advisory board, so I should say at the Human Flourishing Program that we had last year a planning grant, uh, thanks to the John Templeton Foundation, to put together a proposal for a more significant study of interpersonal love. We're trying to conceptualize and measure interpersonal love. And we had the benefit of drawing upon the wisdom of an advisory board. And one of our advisory board members, Judith Greenberg, produced some years ago a two volume encyclopedia of love in world religions. And that's fascinating to read through because you see all of these different nuances in terms of how people understand the divine and how they experience the divine and how they engage in different kinds of rituals to to uh, get in touch with the divine. But you know, one, one thing that's pretty clear is that there is a concern with love as um, kind of the energy for contributing to the growth and, and the good of others. And so that's, you know, I think there is a shared sacred story to be told mm -hmm. around love that could transcend some of the divisions you find within religious traditions or across religious traditions. And it might be love that unites us. And again, as Tillich said, love is life in its actual unity. So if we're actually going to find unity, it's probably <laughs> going to be related yeah. to love in some way, because, you know, what's the, what's the motivation for wanting to understand another perspective? If I have my perspective and I'm happy with it and I think I'm right, then it's my job to impose that on you mm -hmm. and on everyone else. But love offers us... Um, you know, a little bit of motivation to want to understand the other as other, and not just as a projection of our desire of what they should be. Um, and so we can begin to open our hearts a little bit and listen and actually care about what's being said. We're not playing a game of chess where I'm trying to think three moves ahead while you're telling me your story, but I actually want to listen to you. So, you know, Martin Buber talked about the I and thou relationship as opposed to the I and it. And the it is an object. So if you're just an object to me, I don't really have to pay attention to you all that mm. much. I can just sort of hear you out and then come with my counter argument. But if you're a thou, if you're a subject and I'm a subject, then um, there's sacred value to you. And, and that that means that it's a joy for me to actually hear you and meet you where you're at to try to understand your perspective. And so I think that, you know, sometimes we use the word love to talk about that motivation to want to, to deeply listen, to deeply understand, to be in an I and thou relationship instead of just manipulating mm -hmm. objects. And so I think that love um, shows up reliably in religious traditions around the world um, in whatever label, um, you know, people are, are using. Um, it shows up reliably because it seems to point to that transcendent experience of, you know, I don't want to destroy you. I actually want to be in relationship with you in some way. And there's a lot of pressure to divide and, and to separate and to not listen. And so, um, you know, there, there seems to be a principle that's found across traditions. It could be part of this shared sacred story that unites people. And I, we can call it something else if love is not the right word for it. I, some people say, well, let's call it care. All right, well, whatever we call it, we're trying to use language to point to the same thing.
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a, a beautiful response. I, I, your response was uh, uh, the kind of response I would expect from maybe a sociologist or someone who's a scholar of religious studies. Um, as, I can, as, I, as I am a sociologist. That's, that's, so that's right. right. <laughs> it was perfect. <laughs> I'm going to really put you on a hot seat now. All right. Uh, I can imagine some of my theologian friends saying, OK, that's all fine and dandy. But what about God? Uh, obviously, some religious traditions don't have God. And within those traditions that do have a God, they have very different views of what God <laughs> is up to and like. But in this particular global flourishing study, when you bring about religion, is there any any place for the divine in terms of divine action? Or are you kind of bracketing that out saying, look, that's a, a potato too hot to handle? Yeah. Uh, how do you think about that? No, that's definitely part of the study. And, and even going back to the grant that we worked on over a decade ago, um, yeah. you know, we, we would try to ask people about their perceptions and then study the impact of those perceptions. So we mm -hmm. had um, a series of questions and we actually have some questions related to um, love and God in this global flourishing study, but we had certainly more questions. We had more room for questions in the previous grant. And so what difference does it make? For example, we had a question, um, to, to what extent do you agree that God is the, um, most power, you know, most powerful force in the universe, and to what extent do you think God loves you? And so we had all of these kinds of questions, and we can yeah. begin to see what are the effects of people saying they've had these perceived experiences, and we're not trying to pass judgment about whether they're sure. um, verifiable or not, but this is what they're telling us, this is self-report, and what is the effect on various outcomes? And we found in that project that uh, people who said that God loved them at a higher level or that God was a powerful force in the universe um, tended to, to feel more empowered to engage in benevolent service. So they gave more money, they gave more of their time, they gave it a wider level of extensity. So it wasn't just for the near and dear, but for people around the world. And so there, there were a variety of positive outcomes associated with the perception that you've had these experiences. And I, I think, you know, the skeptic can say, well, you haven't proven the existence of God. No, and we no. would say that science can't do that. Science doesn't try to do that. But what yeah. we can say is that we've tried to listen to people to understand what language would resonate with them. So that when we ask the question, we're tapping into the experiences that they tell us they've been having. And if we do that better, we will have better predictive ability. And if we're just unconcerned, um, about that, then we might just ask, you know, some very crude questions and, and not get very far indeed. So I, I do think that there's, um, we don't, you know, we're not trying to put different countries in a kind of horse race to see who's <laughs> flourishing the most, because, you know, in some cultures, and we've, we've had people say this to us, um, you know, if I say I'm 10 out of 10 on any of these domains, then I'm not humble enough, then right, I'm right. greedy, or I'm, I'm narcissistic, or I'm taking too much for my community. So if I'm a 10, I should be giving a little bit more, and I should be at eight or a, you know seven. And so, you know, I think it's the wrong thing to do to say, well, this society, you know, like they do in the World Happiness Report, this is the happiest society. You know, one right. time Finland was labeled the happy, happiest society. And somebody from Finland wrote an op-ed and said, have you ever spent any time with us? <laughs> you know, we accept- Well, the Scandinavian countries always seem to score high on those measures. We, we, <laughs> we, accept, um, we accept our lot and we're content with that. But, you know, this author in particular was writing from the United States and says, I see a lot more vitality and joy in the United States than I see in Finland. So really what you're getting there is a kind of life satisfaction where mm -hmm. I don't have that much, but I don't expect that much. So I'm in. Yeah. And, that, yeah. and so there's different ways to measure it. And I, I think that it's really important for us to be thinking about the results that we're going to get, not in terms of proving which country is superior and what factors does that, what ing magic ingredients does that country have that leads to that superiority, but how do the different variables um, associate with changes over time in flourishing, however understood, because if the baseline's five out of 10, because we're all very humble, 
that we want to see, you know, what happens when things vary over time. And if the baseline's 10 out of 10, because we're all narcissistic, then what happens when things vary over time? So I, I'm being a little bit, you know, glib yeah. about this, but, uh, but the point is that, you know, we, we don't want to declare winners and losers in a thoughtless kind of way. We really want to understand. And so every, every set of results that I get, it just leads me to ask deeper questions. And so yeah. that's the search here. That's beautiful. And um, I, I like the way you focused in on yourself there at the end, because my, que my next question is more about your own work. You've done a really fantastic job, not only of describing, describing the breadth of this new 40 plus million dollar project, but also your awareness of the literature and the research in, in this general field of uh, flourishing love studies is really impressive. But what I, I would like to know is, you know, in that big in that broad category, where are your own interests really focusing these days? I know you have a particular role in the new project, but uh, tell us about your own your own specific work. Well, thank you for uh, for focusing in on that. So um, I've got a, a chapter coming out in a book on love and business organizing, and you know I think that love, rightly understood can be a very helpful principle in, um, in business organizing. And I worked with a, a group of scholars to produce an article um, in, in the, uh, what was it called? The Humanistic Management Journal that just came out um, recently, where we, you know, we try to point out, this is not theoretical. Companies that care actually are more financially sustainable and mm -hmm. they do good in the world. And so like, why are we, pretending this is not you know true when in fact it's demonstrably true and so then the question is you know what do we mean by love and if we can figure out what love is if there's an essence to love a core to love can we use that as the basis for grounding our studies of flourishing to overcome some of these mm. um, challenges where you know there's so many disparate results it's hard to make sense of findings across studies so it's hard to build policy if you've got mixed results all the time, but if we understood love and if we figured out that that was the core of flourishing too, what would, what would that do for our research? So that's what's animating me at the moment. And so yeah. one definition of love that I uh, tried to develop in, in one of these articles is, you know, I was thinking about the way we often define love as a noun or a verb or sometimes a noun and a verb and it doesn't seem quite adequate. It, it seems like, you know, love is about a set of constituents. They could be nouns, verbs, adjectives, or whatever that um, promote flourishing. And I know you've talked about promoting well-being in your, your definition of love. Um, when you put these things together in situationally and development, developmentally appropriate ways with practical wisdom, um, according to a unifying grammar. So it's not just the parts of speech, you know, love is a feeling, that's a noun, or love is an action, that's a verb. But putting these parts of speech together according to a unifying grammar to tell a life affirming story and not just a life affirming story for my own personal experience, but for the human family and the planet as a mm -hmm. whole and the kingdom of God, if you're religious. And so yeah. begin beginning to link to, to you know, broader narratives. And so if you, um, if you start to think about love in these ways, then something like guilt could be um, an important constituent of love. If it's the right. right kind of guilt for the right, too much guilt for the wrong reason gets in the way of love, but right, right, right. not enough guilt. And, you know, you're doing all kinds of bad things. You don't care about it. So, um, so really the constituents can be quite various. Um, mm -hmm. And the question is, are we putting it together in ways that make sense for this larger story? And sometimes that means that we um, experience sacrifice, we experience suffering. And so love actually opens us up, you know, to, to more vulnerability to suffering and the possibility of sacrifice. And, it, and sometimes we not, might not always feel happy about that in the short run, but in the long run, this life affirming story that the community has agreed upon um, is, is more likely if we have a more mature, healthy, 
understanding of love. So that's what I've been working on. Mm, I um, like it. You know, conceptually and in the context of this planning grant that we've had, and now in the global flourishing um, study, which has one question on on love, which you know is um, you, you like to have multiple items and and be able to see how they hold together, but. Um, but one question with 250,000 people can maybe do a lot of work. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's where I'm headed in the near future. But, I, but it, it, what's animating me, I was trained as a sociologist. And in that discipline, it's mostly social constructionist rather than yeah. some kind of normative perspective. In humanities, right. it would be anti-foundationalist rather than. Right. Right. So, you know, I was trained in that. And I understand the, the reasons for that and the value of that. But lately, I've been interested in trying to identify the essence of love. And I know it's controversial and some people it's a non-starter. Um, but I, I, I feel like, like I feel I like, like Tom, it, over, yeah, over the over the years, Tom, <laughs> you and I have talked about this. And there yep. are people who who think that it's worth it's a conversation worth having. And and I'd yeah. like to demonstrate it empirically to the extent that our methods will allow. But it's still Excellent. third best. <laughs> <laughs> I like it, Matt. Thanks so much. This has been a, a, an awesome conversation. In fact, Great, I can thanks. imagine people listening or watching saying to themselves, uh, you know, this is cool stuff. I want to keep abreast of what Matt and the, and the uh, grant is up to. And since this is the International Society for Science and Religion, there's lots of scholars, other people saying, man, I would really love to help out or join in or participate in some way. How would you answer those two questions? Keeping informed and yeah. is there any way to be involved? Well, we have a, the program has a website. So I think if you type into a search engine, Harvard Human Flourishing Program, I think you'll find the site pretty quickly. And we each have an individual page. So if you wanted to follow the work that any of us are doing, you know, we try to update that. We have events. We're actually in the process today of hosting a two-day public workshop on Kierkegaard and love. Mm. And so um, we're always doing something like that. Interesting. So, so you can get involved in our public events. We have a free um app that you can download to your phone. I think it's now on both the Google and Apple platforms. It's certainly it's on our website where you can self-assess the flourishing um, survey and a comprehensive measure of meaning and some of our other measures and then get some guidance on um, activities that have been, you know, empirically demonstrated to improve one or more of these well-being domains. Um, and so that's, you know, that's a helpful tool and resource. And, and what's that called again? That sounds really interesting to me. It's the flourishing what? app. And you know what? I the can flourishing app. I can okay. give you um, the exact web address here. Um, well, I'll tell you what, we'll put that in the show notes. Uh, okay. When we're great. done here. Yeah. It's we'll just, it's just flourishing.app. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's easy. Um, and the other thing is that we've, um, that I, you know, I founded a couple of years ago, a community of practice around flourishing that started very small, but now it has like 200 people. So we're reimagining this over the next few months and we've already relabeled it the Flourishing Network. And we'll invite people to join um, the Flourishing Network and get involved in our um, monthly meetings and some of our webinars and other kinds of things. So um, it's gotten too big to be a single community of practice. So we'll have communities <laughs> of practice within it. Um, but that's another way to get involved in a really uh, practical way. And you don't have to be an academic. We've got um, scholars, sure. we've got practitioners, all sorts of sectors. So um, there, there's a number of ways, but the website's a good place to start. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. I think the program might be on Facebook and some of the other platforms. Great. Well, Matt, thanks so much for a great conversation. Thank you.